You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast produced by Veteran Strategies and featuring conversations with fascinating and impactful men and women who have shaped our world, our communities, and our history. My name is Robert Vane, Principal of Veteran Strategies, and your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, an Indiana-based public relations enterprise and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmon Construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and NFP, a national insurance broker with strong local content. Our podcast is featured on the All Indiana Podcast Network in partnership with Wish TV. You may find Leaders and Legends at allindianapodcastnetwork.com. Thinking of starting a podcast or need to host a public meeting? Let Leaders and Legends LLC be your partner as you look for new ways to communicate your message. Please contact Chris Spangle or me at leadersandlegends.net. And as always, all our podcast interviews are dedicated to the legacy and generosity of P.E. McAllister. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Along with frequent guest host, Jim Shella, we have Robert T. Grand. Does that stand for like Tiberius? Oh, no. Tecumseh? Terry. Terry. He has been a fixture in both the legal world here in Indianapolis and beyond, but also has done significant political work. We're going to talk to him about his career and probably the most underrated aspect of Bob's contribution to Hoosiers, and that is, that is his sterling and voluminous charity work. Jim, thank you for hanging. How you doing? <laughs> Robert, great I'm, to see you. I'm great. Thank you. Great to be here. It's okay if we call you Bob. Yes. <laughs> you got to call me Robert. <laughs> call him Robert, right. We, we, so we can differentiate. <laughs> right. Uh, um. We, you've got a, a, a long and varied background, um, but y- you started out as a, what, at least at the time, was a rare commodity, a, a Lake County Republican. Correct. Correct. How'd that happen? Well, it happened because in 1964, uh, our neighbor, who was a precinct committeeman, hired me to pass out uh, Barry Goldwater uh, handouts, and he gave me a dollar for each block that I did. And so uh, I became a Republican. Um, My parents, my dad was then a steel worker, had just left uh, and was on the process of leaving to become insurance uh, salesman. My mother did not work outside the home. And so um, they were both from Gary, Indiana, and uh, union backgrounds. But uh, I became a little bit of a a differential, if you will, in terms of the family network. How old were you in 1964? I was nine. Nine. And that was your first political involvement. That was my per- first job. Um, been pretty active ever since. Pretty active. Um, I got involved uh, in student government. I uh, got involved in some of the young Republican uh, things for Lake County. I was fortunate enough to serve. Um, only made one mistake that almost cost me that is when I was asked by then Mitch Daniels to endorse uh, Richard Luger, the mayor of Indianapolis, um, in that 76 race. I neglected to tell my county chairman who had actually endorsed uh, Ed Whitcomb. So uh, his, uh, his view to me, the legendary Joe Cazzo, was you better hope that your guy wins because if he doesn't, you will not be the young Republican chairman. So. <laughs> and Richard Nixon won. Uh, uh, no, I'm Luger. Richard Luger. I mean, Richard Luger, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. That's all right. We were talking about Nixon earlier. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah. um, you went to Wabash College. Mm-hmm. Uh, how come? Uh, in large part because they hosted a symposium my senior year, junior year in high school, overflowing into my senior year, I guess it was a fall um, of my senior year, maybe it was junior year, I'm sorry. And uh, it was about um, their uh, uh, their commitment to uh, legal education. They brought in a lot of famous lawyers then, the, probably the most famous, Judge Peck of the New York uh, Circuit or District Court. Um, but they put on a big presentation about this is the place you want to go if you want to be a lawyer, and I always wanted to be a lawyer, and uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, get in. 
uh, although my guidance counselor told me I'd never make it there because uh, I wasn't smart enough, but uh, I ended up going, and uh, a couple guys from my high school recruited me into the fraternity, and I had a great experience. There's an awful lot of uh, Republican leaders who uh, have come out of Wabash College, mm-hmm. and there are some Democrats, too, but uh, um, did you go there be- because uh, it- it's a— Something of a conservative hotbed? I did not really. I didn't even think about it back in those days. I was, uh, my exposure to politics was I got recruited again to work on the Luger campaign by Daniels and Mark Miles. And Matt I was just going to ask you if you knew Miles yeah, and Wabash. Yeah, Miles put me to work. I went down to the county and had to fill out the uh, county postcards with the voter IDs on it so that we could do a mailer to those folks. So that was kind of an interesting uh, opportunity. And, um, so I was able, yeah, and some uh, some notable, Ed McLean was there, a big Republican conservative uh, from that area. Obviously, uh, Dick Rustine, who became a great mentor. I uh, learned a lot about his political career over the course of time. Um, was David Brooks there when you were there? David Brooks was there a year ahead of me. Um, so not, you, not Brooks, a, and not, Miles were all at Wabash at the same and Miles time? And, Miles and, and Brooks were on the tennis team together. And uh, and Brooks was a great, probably one of the greatest Division three foot uh, uh, tennis players. You know, went to the national finals. So yeah, we were all there, and uh, we were all pretty active. We had Scott Pastrick in our fraternity, whose dad was the legendary mayor of East Chicago. So that we had a Democrat, yeah, yeah, Democrat. So yeah, his dad was uh, the 1960 Kennedy chairman in right, Indiana, right. I do believe. Yeah. Right. Um, Interesting. So, I mean, did you envision uh, the sort of political involvement that you've had in your life before uh, hooking up with these folks at Wabash? I, I really didn't. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I, as I said, the the my family background. My grandfather on my father's side was uh, with the uh, uh, railroad. Uh, Union I was actually a lobbyist at some point down here. Um, so my other grandparents were all steel workers. They, everybody was a steel worker or railroad folk. So they were all obviously came from a very union background where there weren't a lot of Republicans. Um, but um, but I had a great experience. I met a lot of neat people, and uh, the the college experience was particularly rewarding because again, getting to work with Dick Luger. I was invited the night of the victory in 1976. Uh, so that was a phenomenal opportunity and, and formed a great relationship. And uh, he had actually spoken. He's a member of the same college fraternity. I am Beta Theta Pi, and I'd met him. And uh, so he was a great role model. And as, as I think you know, I went on to serve as his treasurer for almost 25 years. And, and But that, that initial networking was what got me into politics. Okay. Your first real job, though, was working for Bob Orr. Yeah. And I mean, that's a good example. I came to go to law school at night I mean, during the day, I, my mother and I had saved up enough money for me to go full time. Uh, so I went full time the first year. I was running out of money, and I was volunteering. And so Gordon Durnell was running the 1979 effort for Bob Orr, and they had a deal where at the old Wilson Building, they'd invite people over. You could stuff envelopes, lick envelopes, put stamps, whatever, and they'd buy you a pizza and beer. <laughs> And I showed up, and uh, because it was free pizza and free beer, uh, I knew a couple of guys that were there. Um, and one day, Gordon Deneau walked up to me and he said, "Hey, uh, you know, we understand you're in law school." I said, "Yeah." And he said, "We understand you went to Wabash College." We said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, you can write." Uh, I said, well, I can write, yeah. And so they put me to work doing a volunteer project on research. And uh, the next thing I knew, I was sitting in the lieutenant governor's office, and he was offering me a job. Um, it was a great, obviously, the changed my life in that sense. I had to go to a night law school. Um, but, uh, yeah, Bob Orr was, uh, hired me and uh, traveled with him the state for the better part of three years. You were, you were a scheduler? Or you I was were... a scheduler, advanced man, constituency guy. Um, <laughs> you know, um, you, you name it, I did it. Um, and, uh, I mean, Bob Orr um, w- was not... Uh, the most TV ready governor. He was, he, I mean, I think folks at home uh, had a, a view of him as, as kind of a stiff uh, sort of politician, but uh, he, I, I'm thinking he was a great guy to learn from. Well, I, I mean, every day, you know, I mean, the guy worked from six o'clock in the morning until, you know, 11 o'clock at night. And, uh, 
for those times that I was with him, both when he was lieutenant governor and then the first two years of governor. I mean, that was nonstop. Um, and in the days as lieutenant governor and in the campaign, it was just myself and he in a car. And so you can imagine the kinds of lessons, you know, pulling off, you know, on the way to Bloomington to see the, you know, Civil War marker in uh, um, Morgan County. I forget the name of the little town. You know, I mean, and then being late for the event and him blaming me, but he, you know, he, he, but, but, uh, you know, the, the guy, you know, as I say many, many times, it's not a day that goes by that I don't, am not thankful for the experience. But, you know, here's a guy that, you know, was a Yale undergraduate, two credits short of a Harvard uh, uh, MBA, and he left and, and enlisted in World War II. So, I mean, a finer man in terms, and, and a guy that, you know, in his, in his number one theory that he taught me, and I've tried to practice this over the years in terms of my own professional career, was two things. One, <clears throat> surround yourself with people that are smarter than you, number one, arguably, and that's not really wasn't the case because he's a very smart guy. Number two was surround yourself with young people, and that's what he did. And just quickly to append to that World War II story, and it may have been, I think it's Jim and Bob and Mark Lovers and Darlene Sherman, we did the podcast just kind of commemorating Governor Orr's life, and that Harvard offered him the degree or something, and he yeah. wouldn't take it because he was two credits or he was short of it, and they were like, we'll just give it to you, and he said? No, he, but he went for the honorary degree, and... You know, that was back when I was, of course, I was practicing law. Then I was his outside counsel. And don't ask me how I got involved in this, but he was so adamant that they had me talk to the office, the alumni affairs, and he had to have a stipulation that they would not award him the actual degree, but they would give him an honorary degree, to which the then president of Harvard, I can't remember who it was, actually called me on the phone and started yelling at me. Like, this is the stupidest thing we've ever heard. I mean, you're offered an, a degree from Harvard. And so, but when he showed up at the reunion, it was his 40th, uh, 44, mm -hmm. uh, he showed up at that reunion and to a, you know, the 60 or 70 classmates were all just like, this is the coolest thing in the world, you know, that you. Like, like George C. Scott gets saying, no, I don't want that Oscar. Yeah. Or Marlon Brando. Uh, yeah. Did you know Bob back in the or days? No. Um, I came to town in 82, and uh, as Bob just said, he left the governor's office in 81. I'm sure— 82. I'm sure, we overlapped for, I think, a year. It, okay, yeah. I didn't get to town until December of 82. Yeah. Um, I mean, I— And I left. <clears throat> I left and I graduated 82, so yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, right, Bob was work. around. He was around. We we got acquainted fairly early on, I'm sure, but uh, I don't believe he was in the governor's office when I got to know no. him. No, no. You talked about some of the people you met in Wabash. Please, please describe some of the people you met working for Bob Orr, because it really is a college of cardinals when it comes to accomplishments and influence on the state. Well, the, the, the staff people, you know, all very, very close. Um, you know, obviously, Ken Cochran was the chief of staff, and he and John Hammond. John Hammond left the job to go to the campaign. That's what opened up for me, and those are the two guys that actually came. People always say, as, as recently as two weeks ago, somebody said, well, they, they didn't want to invite Bob Grant and have him in the same room with John Hammond, and the, and the person, lover, said to him, are you crazy? <laughs> those guys were like best friends, and nobody could believe it. I mean, they think that all these years that we've – done all these things. John, John and I are extremely close. I mean, But you worked at competing law firms. Uh, well, we were. I, yeah, it would be, it would be logical, but the sense is that everybody right. does it. But but we were extraordinarily extraordinarily loyal to each other, and we get together on a regular occasion. But So John, Jan Powell was in charge of the media. She was a, she was a very good person. Um, but the special relationship that I had was with Judge Ryan. Uh, you know, he was a guy that kind of adopted me. And the reason why he adopted me was because when I got hired, I had been in the legislature. I had been Phil Warner's legislative assistant, and they had tried to— the Re ISTA, Republican from Elkhart. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they tried to—he was the chairman of the Education Committee, and the ISTA tried to beat him one year, and they lost. And so the next year, you can imagine the kinds of bills that got introduced, and uh, <laughs> I, was his, I was his person. And so what happened was Bob Orr hired me on a kind of a very quick interview— Whatever, I came in, put a suit and tie on, I got hired, and I was going to start the next week because John was anxious to get to the campaign. So this was all just a real flurry. You know, I had to go re-enroll in the law school, everything. And the second day on the job, first day on the job, Judge Ryan walks into my office. If those of you remember him, he was a short man, you know, a great Irishman. Uh, had a cigarette in his mouth, and I had an office with a you know one little chair, and I was backed up to a window, 
And the guy walks in, and he sits down, and he looks across at me, and he says, you know, I love you. Now, this is back in the seminar. You know, people, you know, the people just don't say this, right? And you're looking at them, and, you know, I'm thinking to myself, this is the weirdest thing in the world, you know. And he takes a drag on a cigarette, and he goes, you, you, you don't know why. And I'm thinking to myself, this is a trick question. You know, I don't know what the answer is. And he goes, well, he said the ISTA leadership just came in an hour ago, and they demanded that Bob Orr fire you because you are the most, you know, headstrong, anti-education guy they've ever met. You were Phil Warner's legislative assistant. I mean, seriously. And so he said, so I looked at Bob Orr. I said, is this the best hire we've ever made? And so he goes, I don't know you, never met you, but you're my guy. So, so he went on to do great things for me and was very helpful. Well, and Bob Orr's legacy ended up being uh, improvements in education in his second term, uh, lower class sizes and, and uh, the A-plus program. And uh, I, I remember <laughs> Phil Warner chairing those committee hearings because he allowed all testimony. They went on forever. Uh, <laughs> right. And, and you, in the, the podcast we did about Governor Orr, which I didn't realize till after the podcast, I looked it up. Amazingly, when when the top of the ticket, President Reagan is winning forty nine states, or barely won reelection in eighty four. Mm-hmm. How did that happen, or almost happen? I guess I should say. And were, Bob, were you involved and worried? I was involved, uh, not overly worried. Um, we had a national polling outfit out of D. I forget who. Uh, I could think see his face, um, but but we were we were not overly worried in the sense in uh, because we knew that there was a strong undercurrent there. Um, he took a lot of heat on the utility issue. He took a lot of heat. You know, Wayne Townsend, you know, and Ann Delaney were two firebrands. I mean, they were after him every day of the week, and it it goes to show what I say to people when I coach them in campaigns: you have to be aggressive. Uh, on your message. I mean, you can't just let things be, you know, and you have to respond. And Bob Orr was, you know, in my opinion, I don't think he wanted to respond. I don't think people thought he needed to respond a whole bunch, but they, they, they put, they put some, they put some pain on him. But overall, well, the biggest problem he had was he raised taxes in 82. And he raised taxes in 82, which which hurt him. Mm -hmm. Um, But he'd also been the vote that cast, he cast the vote for property tax relief, so he broke that tie. So, and that was a big legacy for him. But, you know, it was a tough year, but I I wouldn't say I was worried. Uh, I think we were all, you know, a little bit nervous. Um, We really were. We were really worried in 82. (laughs) 82, we were really worried because of that. Had that election gone another six or eight weeks, we would have been in trouble. Gordon Durnell, who ran that, that campaign for Bob Orr as well, uh, had negative ads prepared. At that, at that point, it, it seems weird to talk about now uh, in today's environment, but there had never been a negative ad Correct. run in a statewide campaign in <clears throat> Indiana. And Bob Orr had negative ads prepared because they were concerned that Wayne Townsend was too close too late. And the most amazing thing about those ads, which you didn't see, but one of the great things was the debate. So I was in charge of all the opposition research, myself, another lawyer. And the best line ever, which really was incredible, is that Wayne Townsend, in all the years he'd been in the House and the Senate, had never authored, co-authored, sponsored, or co-sponsored any bill to do with education. Okay, And it was an amazing statistic. And so when I came into the meeting with Gordon and John and Ken and I presented this research. Bob, we were in a re- Bob, we looked at me and he goes, "There's no way that's true." And I had been through every single record. You know, back then you had to go to the archives. They were mm. open historical. I mean, I went through every single vote. Right, I had to go do it again. He said, "We're not going to go that." And he did on the. <laughs> and I did. I came back and he looked me in the eye and he said, "I'm going to make this statement in this debate." And he made it. And, of course, Bill Morrow, who's a longtime friend of mine, mm-hmm. after that debate was just like, you know, where in the heck did you come up with that? Of course, nobody ever said it was wrong, right? I mean, so, but uh, it was a pretty powerful deal. Speaking of Bill Morrow and elections, 1988, mm-hmm. assume, I'm going to assume, forgive me for doing so, that you were close or knew John Mutz. A little bit? Yeah. Were you involved in that campaign? I I really wasn't involved in that campaign per se because what I had – I mean, I was involved being helpful, and I was trying to help Bob Orr because I was serving as Bob Orr's uh, person. uh, But I wasn't involved like, you know, you would Mm -hmm. say involved. Mike, obviously, Mike McDaniel was the lead on that. I had a great relationship with Mike. 
Um, but um, that was a that was a difficult campaign, um, and uh, there were a lot of issues. Um, but in part, I think that uh, Bob Ward did, you know, had as you mentioned, the people had perceived the '84 election being close. Question was, what could Bob Ward really do in '88? He did as much as he could. I mean, he helped uh, John a lot, particularly in the, in the convention, the lieutenant or the direct primary, the lieutenant governor. Mm-hmm. You know, he let that postcard go out that had a picture with him and John Mutz the week before, which was uh, raised a lot of a lot of controversy. But uh, why was it controversial? Because it was essentially an endorsement, and uh, it was it, it, McDaniel was genius. He still to this day denies he didn't, you know. But it was a, it, <laughs> it was an endorsement. It was written. It was read as an endorsement, and it became an endorsement. And it's and it's one of the reasons why I think it's they were so close because Otis Bowen had done the same thing for Bob Orr. I mean, he 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 spent every waking moment promoting Bob Orr to be the next governor, and Bob Orr spent every waking moment promoting. Um, um, John Mutz. Were you you covered that race, obviously, Jim? Were you yes. surprised at the outcome? No. By beating Mutz? No. Uh, oh, you're in '88 now. I, th- mm. I, I was I was still stuck in '84. Um, <laughs> no, I was not surprised that Evan By beat John Mutz in 1988. Um, Evan By was uh, uh, the hot new property, um, and. There had been uh, a long string of Republicans, and the and the public was ready for a change. And we made a terrible mistake, and we we there were differences of opinions. I go back and relitigate it because most of those people are not alive. But uh, it was a mistake, and in, 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 in I think people thought to go with the challenge on the residency. Mm. Bob War was focused on a, uh, an election in South Carolina that occurred the year before, where they had not done that. And the person, you know, it got to the end and it became a big problem. So he decided to put it up first and foremost. And it was just, you know, it created Evan and Susan on the nightly news. I mean, that Shelbyville in and out of that courtroom every day, in and out with a with a commentary with Jim Shella standing there saying, <laughs> Do you, don't you think this is outrageous? I mean, you, you know, your father was a United States senator. And, you know, and, and so it, uh, I don't it, think I don't think I put it quite like that. No, I'm just but 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 <laughs> it, that's that's really I mean when you stand back and, and take the long view, it it was an effort to show that it, that Evan By was not a Hoosier and the public Which didn't buy that. That was the great irony of when he got beat the last time of going back the opposite, right? right. Trying to and become a Hoosier when you clearly were not in this, you know, whatever. So then it's just it's just a great. I, I just think the whole residency thing is just is just crazy, and and it was proven in that case. It was proven they went after Dick Luger. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense, right? I mean, you're a Hoosier, you're a Hoosier, and uh, I think that was going to be a hard hard thing. But I think it was a big mistake. Um, yeah. So you went into the practice of law, uh, Barnes and Thornburg, but never got out of politics. I was in Bingham Summers, actually, for four years. Okay. I went to Barnes in 1987. Okay. I never really did get out of politics because when I left um, the governor's office, you know, the governor really was not, he, I mean, he, he, he let me leave, but that, that would be the way to describe it. He let me leave. But part of the condition <laughs> of me leaving was that I had to stay involved with him and be helpful. Like I said, I took on the research, great experience. Um, and then where I really got my big is that he called me in one day and he gave me a $50 bill and he said, you are going to take a lady by the name of Marjo Laughlin out to lunch because I'm going to have you run her campaign. And uh, I never met Marjo Laughlin. I know who she was. I knew a lot of her convention stuff. She'd been a good popular person and didn't realize that she was the one that cast the votes to make Bob Ward the lieutenant governor. So that became obvious later on in this whole story. But but the truth of the matter is I didn't know her. I took her to the King Cole. I paid for lunch. Uh, the next day, uh, the, uh, the governor called me and said, what do you think? And I said, well, I got a one-year-old child. I'm not sure I'm up for a campaign. And then two consecutive days, the managing partner of Bingham Summers came into my office and said, I got a strange call from the governor today. And he said he just sent this big piece of business and he really wanted me just to come and tell you that they were using us on this. And second day, and so the third day I picked up the phone, I called him, I said, I get the message. He goes, I'm glad because I was going to call the managing partner and just take that business back. <laughs> well, that happened. Well, and Mar- Marge was running for state treasurer. Right. And, 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 and Thuma had been endorsed by Otis Bowen. Then Otis Bowen had to drop out of the race because of the Hatch Act because he got he became secretary of HHS. That's right. So there was Marjo 
And I could kid about Bob Ward. Obviously, he was always kidding me about the opportunities he'd given us. He'd given me a lot of business, but I, I could just tell that he really wanted me to do this this deal, and we, we joked about it all the time. And Marjo Laughlin, one of four people. Yeah, is it five? Four to have won four statewide elections on her own. It's her Luger, Evan By. Anybody know the other one? Whew. I'm not good at trivia. Yeah. Don't Tim Barry. Tim Barry. I think those are the only ones, so <laughs> please correct me, leaders and legends audience, if yeah. not. What was Marjo Laughlin like, other than like shaking her hand a few times? Unbelievable. I mean, she was just a great, uh, and, and again, this whole. I just didn't know her. Yeah, this, this whole great idea about just such a really nice, pleasant person. And, and uh, like I said, Bob War with such a great relationship with her. And, and she had a lot of issues when she got elected to state treasurer. There were a number of people that wanted certain people to have other appointments. And, you know, he managed, he helped her. He, they were extremely close. But that's why I joke with people. They always come back to this whole idea about Bob War putting pressure. I mean, it, it was a subtle pressure I, I joke about in the sense that he really wanted her to have a campaign manager and he wanted me to do it. It was the greatest thing that happened because once we did that race and we raised all that money, because then back then you could take money from investment bankers and mm-hmm. all the people that were interested, right? I know it's all bad now, but we raised a lot of money and she ran a phenomenal ads. Uh, you know, we did display negative ads, um, not the first time, but the second time because you ran against a guy named Rich Bell, which we didn't have to expend any negative ads. Uh, uh, Pat Traub helped us immensely on that one because she accused him of, he accused her of a crime essentially on some kind of deal. And so Pat Traub wrote article after article about how we should prosecute him, but you know, whatever. You know, this <laughs> but um, but uh, she was just a magnificent woman, a great party person, and uh, you know, somebody that was uh, just a, a, a loyal friend and a great person. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, an Indiana-based public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Garmond Construction, Leaders and Legends, LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and NFP, a national insurance broker with strong local content. Our guest today is Bob Grand. Our co-host is Jim Shella. Bob, other than, let's say, maybe Luger and Orr or whatever, is there a particular Hoosier leader and or legend you admire? Well, I think you go back if you say, in, in, I mean, uh, putting those folks up there in terms of the career that they did uh, and the things that I had, I mentioned those those people were very influential in my life. I mean, in every aspect of my life. And uh, Dick Luger you know, wrote me a letter to get into law school, a recommendation letter. I mean, you know, like I said, Bob War, Marjo Laughlin was, you know, gave me an incredible opportunity as a young lawyer. Uh, I, I'd say in politics, you meet a lot of really interesting people. I think probably in later years, uh, one of the most interesting people that I ended up having a relationship with, Robert, as you know, was P. McAllister. And, and uh, both you and I spent in different ways, but I think in the similar is just trying to help P.E. as he wanted to be involved in politics, had been involved to, in everything in the community. Um, in the later years, I think people looked at him as the, this guy's very wealthy and, and whatever, but he had so much to add. Um, and, you know, the th- little things that, that he did and in getting involved, he had unbelievable with the CIB, bringing the Colts. I mean, he was just involved with everything. And one of the great honors is I got to take him to the White House when the Colts won the White House. I got tickets. And I took him, or I should say he took me. He said, you get the tickets, I'll get the plane. Uh, but but <laughs> we, we went to the, um, the, uh, uh, the White House. As a matter of fact, one of the, and I, I don't think I've told this story publicly, but one of the best stories ever about that was that we went in there. And so the, um, the, uh, Bobby Vans is a famous steakhouse. And so P.E. wants to have lunch because the ceremony's at 2.30. We get there at 11. So he says, where do we go? I said, well, Bobby Vans is this great steakhouse. So we have with us the folks that were there, many of whom are, are very uh, important people. Uh, Todd Houston was there because he was uh, uh, worked on the Bush campaign, so he was one of the invitees. One of my partners, uh, Ken Yerke, is one of my partners, Brian Burdick, P and myself. But if you could imagine, this is one of my favorite stories. We go into Bobby Vans, and, of course, because I've been in there all the time, I get the front table. So the guy says, what do you want your regulars for lunch? I says, so I take the front table. So we're at the front table. And of course, what does P.E. order but a martini? 
So then everybody feels like they have to order a martini. And, of course, what does he order? But He orders a big steak. So everybody figures like they got to order steak. So you can imagine this day, everybody sit their coats and ties, and his family walks in, obviously on spring break or whatever. And you can see him pause at the door. And I'm seated at the far end of the table with my back, but I can see him. And, and what's his name? Bobby Vans is talking to him. So I can seat you away and whatever. And one of the kids says, Mom, what's that? And you see her go to her kids. That's called lobbyists. <laughs> 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 One of the greatest lines ever, right? We that is that, that is the story you told. Uh, you and I were very <laughs> blessed to be two of his eulogists along with yeah. Jim Morris and Earl Good. Uh, yeah. We should notice at the time of P.E.'s martini ordering that he was about 88, yeah. 89. Yeah. So here's an amazing thing, Robert. I don't know if you know this, but at Meridian Hills, so I would go with him to Meridian Hills all the time. They would bring his martini out first, which, you know, always used to irritate me. I'd say, well, you know, I'm a member, too, and they, they need laugh, whatever, but they do it. <laughs> so upon his passing, I went in one day, and they came in, and they said, um, I said, I'm going to get a P. McAllister, you know, whatever. And so they brought it, and then and Cheryl, the legendary waitress, there, said, well, you know, it's a problem. We have to, you know, they were, wouldn't fill it, so I'm going to go into the—I go, what do you mean they wouldn't fill it? They said, well, Mr. P. had a—Mr. Uh, McAllister had a special glass that we gave him. That's much larger than the rest, and the new waiter would do it. So I'm thinking the whole time I'm having one, he says, I only have one. This is a time and a half mine, I'm having two, thinking I'm an alcoholic, right? So, <laughs> as as my was, daughter says, uh, he was the cutest. Yes. The best of the greatest and yeah, yeah. no replacement. I would like to ask you a little bit, outside of Indiana, you were involved in what was probably the biggest political story in the last... 50 years, maybe? Political story. We'll see what happens with Mr. Trump. <laughs> but the Florida recount. Mm -hmm. How did you get involved in the 2000 Florida recount? And what was it like? I was just interviewed by the Politico guy. I forget his name. Adam. Adam. Adam, Adam yeah. Who, mm -hmm. No, his buddy was writing a book on it. But the, simple, the simple answer is that I'd been very involved in that campaign. A number of us had gone down. Al Hubbard, Kittle, Daniels, myself. Um, Hubbard went down and met with uh, Governor Bush prior to his announcement, and uh, we had signed on to participate with him. So we were in on the kind of ground floor of that whole deal. And as a result of that, in the meeting out came Karl Rove, and people had forgotten that Karl Rove did the direct mail for John Mutz uh, in that 1988 campaign. Mm -hmm. So everybody knew Karl Rove, and I had had a little bit of a relationship with Karl, but because I was the youngest guy, he and I got to be very close, and with Mitch— you know, and, and things. So that relationship really blossomed in the campaign. I became one of the fundraisers along with Al and Kittle. And so we just had a great, great relationship. And then when the election occurred, you know, Carl Rove called me that Sunday after the election and um, a week later, actually, and said, we need you in Florida. We need a lawyer down there. We need help uh, because they were staffing it largely with kind of volunteers, if you will, and the Democrats had shipped in all these union folks and a bunch of hardline people. And so we were facing a, in, in the three counties. And so uh, my son was playing a championship game uh, basketball, and I couldn't go Sunday night. But Monday morning I showed up with then Betsy Burdick, now Betsy Wiley, because she was the only person who could go with me. Everybody else had conflicts. And her parents, her brother was a law partner of mine, but her parents and I were very close. So she was just great. So she went down there with us. And uh, I say we just showed up at the airport back in those days. They gave us a ticket, one-way ticket to uh, uh, Palm, <laughs> Palm Beach. And we went down there and saddled up and were there until the Wednesday, well, until Thanksgiving Day. We flew back Thanksgiving Day. So, What was the ask? I mean, we can guess, but do you have any good stories about the atmosphere? Was it just daggers drawn? And, and by the way, we, had, I, want, had, I want Betsy Wiley on my team yeah. for any fight involving just about yeah, anything. She was unblazed, yeah. Had you ever heard of a hanging Chad prior No, to I had not. But <laughs> I, I, nor I had heard of the butterfly ballots, but I'm, I'm quite an expert on, on all that. I, the, the, there are so many great stories, but I, I think the, the, the way it started off was probably the best was we got there. They introduced me at the airport. You know, they told me that my other four team members would meet me there. They were all guys from D.C. And Betsy and I, of course, they had a van rented for us. We had a hotel. We went to the Holiday Inn. They already had our names. I mean, it was, everything was all prearranged. But, but the great story was we had to go for training, and we show up at the training, and there's only two other lawyers, so I'm the third lawyer, so they got to help me go through all the process. How do you go in? What do you do? 
uh, with big training, but most of that. And then, but the best line was is that when I go in, they drop us off at the van, drops us off at the uh, emergency operations center, and the driver says to the six of us, I hope you guys are ready to go do this because if you screw this up, you know, you might cost a guy presidency of the United States. We're like, whew, a little harsh. But when you walked in, they had two checkpoints. They had a checkpoint to go in and a checkpoint internally, okay? The one outside was the county's check-in to let know who that was going into their emergency operations center. Well, as you can imagine, as you've seen the pictures, the entire parking lot was satellite trucks from everywhere, right? So I went in. We did our first session. It was pretty uneventful. We had a couple of, you know, arguments and whatever. Betsy had one phenomenal argument. And uh, so we came out, and the press had – they were restricted as to where they could be, but they could be, like, within shouting of you. And five or six of these folks start shouting my name. Bob Grand, we want to talk to you. Bob Grand, we want to talk to you. And so all of a sudden, I'm identified. I can't figure out how. They didn't have anybody else's name. So when we went to the curb – I decided, you know, I, I'm just not going to ignore them. I just said, look, you know, so well, we know who you are. You're a lawyer from Indianapolis, blah, 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 blah. They're going through all this stuff. And so finally I look at the guy. I said, well, how do you know that? He, says, he goes, pal. He said, when you pulled your license out for the outside check-in, I said, every camera and every satellite truck was on your license, okay? I mean, that's how they do it. <laughs> and so they followed me. I became kind of the guy that they followed. So when you went to the hotel, they were there. When I went for breakfast, they'd sit there and, and, and uh, friendly, not not unfriendly. But I was reporters you know, are generally friendly. they were friendly. Yeah, but they were they were all in about you know every day what was happening. And of course, your comment was no comment, no comment. And uh, do you, were you there, Jim? You know what? I uh, <laughs> my my story of the two thousand recount is uh, I've not to get too personal, but I've I've had glaucoma since I was eighteen. And I, I was in need of an operation. Uh, and I said, uh, I got to get past the election. Uh, so I scheduled, I scheduled, and November is always a rating p- period in the TV business. So I, I had uh, uh, surgery scheduled for uh, the end of November. And uh, I spent most of my time in the hospital watching this on TV. Yeah. I, I probably would have been there otherwise. Yeah. But, yeah. but I thought, you know, nothing's going to happen after this election. <laughs> <laughs> Were you surprised? Are you somewhat, let me ask a different way. My understanding is, and Jim, please correct me, that every single recount conducted after the 2000 election was decided in Florida, in other words, Bush v. Gore and then Gore's concession speech, that every single recount put Bush as winning the state. Yes. Does that make you feel better about the work you did or you felt like you were? I, I, look, the, the work that we did was really, I, I said this before, and I used to, you know, for a while I was on the speaking tour for a couple of years. I went to about every Lincoln Day because it was, it, was, it was kind of an interesting, you know, story to tell. The story is the thing that made it really interesting was, number one, when we got there, there was very little security over where the ba- ballots were being held, which has always made me nervous mm-hmm. in terms of with the recount, at least in West Palm. And so that was one issue. The other issue was these ballots that had scotch tape chads back in. I always ask the question, who goes to the ballot box? Who goes to the election day with scotch tape? Right. I mean, you know, so, so there were things like that that were anomalies, whatever. And the, but the, the, the chads falling off right in these boxes and, you know, people would collect them. Right. They had little, you know, things of them. I mean, it gave you a little bit of pause for what the recount really meant. Uh, I would tell you in the, in, the, in the count, though, there were very few of, you know, both Gore and, 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 and uh, Bush being clicked out, right? I mean, so that part of the count was good. A lot of the other ballots, you know, the hanging chads, did you count it? You know, was it? Well, in that case, if one's hanging, the other one's still intact, well, why wouldn't you count it? Right. I mean, that was the that was the debate. But that was it was a little bit disconcerting to see how many of those chads had fallen off or, you know, in the process of, you know, handling or, you know, whatever. So but it gave us, you know, we felt pretty good because no matter what they did, you know, the count was a hard count. I mean, you know, even though it was staffed with an in somewhere a Republican, Democrat, Democrat, independent never Republican independent. There was never a time where there was a Republican independent. So it was kind of a weird one there, but uh, but I didn't see any wholesale uh, problems there. Our job was just to get the count, turn it in, and, you know, when we objected, you know, they took it under advisement. But. Well, speaking of your involvement in national, uh, 
stories. You you were on the presidential inaugural committee in mm-hmm. 2016. Mm-hmm. How did that happen? Well, that happened largely because I was asked by uh, then Governor Mike Pence to handle his uh, his uh, vetting, if you will, with the campaign. So I got involved. A young lawyer in our office, Matt Morgan, and I were the guys that were, you know, called. Um, to the uh, to the scene for that effort, uh, so I had a great involvement at that point with uh, the governor. Uh, obviously, I knew Mike Pence from law school, and we were very, very close. Although I kidded him, I didn't support him the first couple of times he ran for Congress. <laughs> so he ran against good friends of mine, but but um, he uh, he had asked us to help with that, so that led to some additional involvement in the campaign, um, and then at the end. Um, we knew because of, you know, how difficult it was going to be to uh, put on a, a decent inaugural. Um, you know, uh, although, you know, when you think about inauguration, then you think about the Bush inaugural, which was even tougher because the time crunch was so sure. – it was like the transition was incredibly uh, hard. Uh, so that was the reason why I was asked. To, but, but more so was my relationship with uh, the governor and the VP. He had a pretty good seat at the, at the inaugural. Yeah, right behind Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> at one point, didn't didn't we all work for Marty Oaks? Yes, right. Yeah. yeah. So Marty Marty was was very helpful. Um, but yeah, that was the that was the picture that went viral when the when they put that out, and there was the picture of Hillary, and I was right behind it, and it was like it was incredible. I mean, people still to this day will come up and they'll have it on their phone. They'll say, "I remember this picture." <laughs> but of course, the worst part was when people never made a big issue out of. Which, if you go back and read the, see the tape, if you watch it carefully and listen to it, you'll. The most amazing thing was when we were put down into the holding room. I was with Fred Klipsch and uh, some other folks, and uh, Fred decided that on the way out to the thing that he was going to go stop at the bathroom. I decided to stop at the bathroom. So we went in, and our group had kind of gotten separated. So we went to this where it looked like where the Supreme Court had just walked through, and that was the holding room. So we were just standing there. And our people were supposed to come back and get us, and they didn't show up for a while. And so we're just standing around talking to people. And, of course, uh, Mattis walks up to me and says, who are you? Because they obviously didn't know each other and whatever. Coates was there, and, and Coates was laughing. He said, well, this is Bob Grant. And, and so Mattis what are you? I said, I'm the lawyer to the campaign or to the vice president or whatever. Really? As he starts telling me stories about how he likes lawyers and all this kind of stuff. Whatever. So, <laughs> so they start lining up for the cabinet. And uh, so Klipsch and the other guys move immediately to the left because the lady comes and gets them and doesn't get me. doesn't say a word to me. So now I'm over here, and I see this lineup. And so Mattis is going here, and I say to Mattis, well, i got to step aside here, and there's a lady standing over there. I said, I think that's if that's with you, that lady's with you or whatever. No, no, that's my best friend's wife. I got her a seat on the platform. I really enjoy talking with you. Just stick with me for a minute. So, I, okay, so we're talking and whatever. And all of a sudden, they announce the cabinet. And so as they walked in, they never pulled me out of the line. So they, when they announced the cabinet, I walked in next to Mattis, and immediately my wife was seated to the left on the platform. I see her. Her eyes are like this. I come by, and the four joint chief of staff turn around and introduce themselves to me. And my <laughs> wife goes, do you realize you just got announced as a member of the cabinet? They said, the cabinet is processing in. You just walked in with Mattis. And the, the the greatest irony of it was is uh, uh, my now just recently deceased best friend from college, Jim Engeldow, was having his employees watch it in one of their big rooms. He said there were 35 people uh, assembled. And when it happened and when it flashed on the screen, the cabin, I walked in, he goes, oh, my God. He said, something <laughs> bad's going to happen because that guy is not in the cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> so later, uh, so later, the, uh, the, the 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 folks with the with the inaugural committee came up to me that that afternoon. They go, "Holy mackerel, was that incredible?" You know how many calls we've had from people like, "Who in the hell was that guy next to Mattis?" They have no idea who you were. <laughs> and what are you six five? So you can't yeah, hide. Couldn't, couldn't hide. <laughs> but the best was the reaction of the, the was the Joint Chiefs of Staff because they were all now my new best friends. You know, because they thought you know I was Mattis or whatever. So. I should I should say and and be. Uh, that, Forrest Gump. It was a Forrest Gump moment. That uh, uh, Bob went to bat for me to try to get me a job at the Pentagon after the Trump election in 2016. And I was newly married and had two younger kids, and I couldn't do it. But, Bob, I'm, I'm very grateful for you going to put my name in the hopper. I want to ask a little bit about another campaign and candidate, 
You're going to love this one, Jim. The Accidental Mayor. <laughs> Greg where, Ballard. Where have I heard that one, phrase before? I think you said it on election night 2007 when you were standing next to me while we were doing coverage of that particular uh, upset. I, I haven't coined too many phrases, but I'll take credit for that. Bob, you... We're on the Ballard train uh, from from Go. Not from Go, but but almost Go. Well, you, compared you to everyone from, else, you were on from Go. Yeah, I was uh, I was there because my wife and my 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 wife Melody and uh, my son Ryan had run cross country with his two kids, and uh, so they knew. So my wife came home after she met with Lisa Kobe at something. I forget where they were at. She said, we're doing a fundraiser at our house. Now, keep in mind, you know, I've done fundraisers at my home for many, many years and had any number of people there. Um, And uh, I said, dear, this is like crazy. She goes, we're doing this fundraiser, and you're doing it, and you're putting your name on it. And uh, so— This fundraiser uh, for Ballard. For Ballard. And he had had not one big fundraiser. He had a couple small ones. Most people were giving money to the party— Somebody was quoted the other day. They were talking about all they did for Ballard. I thought I didn't want to correct them, but the party was raising money for the council. There was nobody giving money to Ballard. But and he we raised, did this, we raised did this fundraiser. 265, I think. We, 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 we he, ran, he ran exactly one TV ad. Right. right. We, we, ran this, we, ran this, uh, we ran this fundraiser, and all of a sudden people start calling me like Jim Merritt, Scott Newman. I mean, everybody, well, if you're going to do this, you know, we put, put our names on it, and we did it at our home, and we had a really good turnout. I mean, it was phenomenal turnout. And it was, it was all handmade sandwiches, handmade. Like somebody got some liquor from Jim Brucker donors. It was like the lowest fundraising <laughs> cost ever because all these people had volunteered to bring, you know, like sandwiches and stuff. But we had it at our home, and, and he was very humble, and he, was, and he made some statement about, you know, whatever. And we raised, a, I think it was about a third or a quarter of what was on hand. Um, and that led to a number of other people stepping up. Uh, PE had already stepped up, but even in a bigger way and others. And it was exciting. And, um, you know, the, the, the best line I had in that thing was a, the week before when, when Bart Peterson had gone on the radio and essentially said that he didn't think Mayor Ballard had the skills to be mayor because, you know, he was just in the military or something to that effect, which was ridiculous, and that lit up the virtual thing. But the other thing was when they ran that little, like a small buy on WIBC against Ballard, and uh, I called him up. Of course, he had no idea because he didn't really know me that well, but he knew me. I called him up and said, man, you're going to win. And he says, how can you tell? I said, there's no way in the world they're running a negative ad on you if they don't have polling that shows you up. Of course, that's when the with that's when the tax took effect in October, right? In mm-hmm. that week, and it was before all that early voting. It was amazing to watch it. Right? Jim, did right. you cover that race pretty solidly? Yes, yes. And the other thing I said on election night <laughs> was that the, the race was Bart Peterson versus not Bart Peterson, right. and not Bart Peterson won. Right. Um, I just remember. Because, go because ahead. What it, oh. I mean. Greg Ballard, be, you know, had a had a great tenure as mayor, um, but nobody knew who he was. Not he had great. zero name ID. So well, it's just like it's just like what we're doing right now. I mean, we're going through this right now. I mean, it's, it's the end of the day is is the idea that you can elect somebody um, because you know of what's happening in in your city. In that case, you know, with taxes and everything else, with raising the tax, it was it was a big deal. The one thing that people don't give Mayor Ballot credit for, which he really did do, and I've said this, I've said this to to folks in recent times, is that he actually did go out a lot of places and 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 had the right, you know, I, I've been telling Republicans, you know, just you know, stop on Pennsylvania Street today, right, and go up to the door or across the street from the big pothole and say, look, well, I'm the, you know, I mean that, and he did a lot of that. He went to neighborhoods, he talked to people. We had, remember, we had those. Uh, townships for a day, and that we had. A, he kept a list of all this stuff. I mean, you know, sewer. Over, I mean, and he, he couldn't fix it all, but that did resonate a little bit. But the tax issue in Meridian Kessler and and closing the police station there, you know, one of my favorite lines was, you know, Lisa Kobe. Every time she did a press conference with him, every single time she did it in front of that police station, you know, so here we are in front of a closed down police station at Forty Third College, blah blah blah. And one time, Dennis Ryerson, you know, the legend, wonderful publisher of the of the Star, called me up. And I was a decent relationship. And he said, I can't believe you keep doing that. It's my neighborhood. Where we go? Well, now we're old. Now we're going to do it forever. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask him about a few other folks. Sure. 
just we're going to run through. I'll just throw some names out. One or two sentences. And you, and then we can move on. I'll let Jim have the last word before we do the five questions. Mitch Daniels. Wonderful guy. Um, um, really gave me a, a great opportunity. Um, you know, he, he denies the story, so lovers will, would tell you. It can't be a few seconds because it's true. They sent me to the Wabash College Chapel the night that uh, Whitcomb was speaking, and I was in college. And you know what my question to Whitcomb was? Why did he veto the 18-year-old drinking uh, law bill? <laughs> so you imagine he went crazy on me, and all the people in Crawford's who loved me were really <laughs> upset with me. And so, so Ms. Daniels denies that, but that, that I had that level of involvement. He, was, he, he gave me a great opportunity because the night of that election, he personally invited me and young guys from Wabash College to come over to the to the celebration. I got to tell you, it was life changing in that sense. So what he did as governor, you know, I'll always uh, appreciate, but I obviously knew him back then. And I think he was the one that probably wrote the letter. I know Luger had edited it, but people wrote those letters for law school. I know chiefs of staff had something to do with it. Did you get to be close with Senator Luger? Yes. Yeah. He's an in, he was an interesting guy in the sense that I never saw him in a bad mood ever. Yeah, never. Except when you made him make fun- fundraising calls, then he was in a bad mood. So, but uh, <laughs> but the most fun I ever had with him was the '96 Iowa. I was with him in Iowa for that uh, for that part of the campaign, and uh, just the daily routine and watching him interact with people and watching his thought process. Mm-hmm. I mean, you just you know, in, but in but a, hit the story of the Iowa caucuses for him in '96. Uh, was mostly that he couldn't get there. Right. Bob Dor- Dole was uh, holding up the vote on the on the farm bill, everything, so that Lamar Alexander and Dick Luger couldn't get to Iowa. I, w- I was in Iowa a week before the caucuses. Right. Uh, You're right. If went out there, had arranged to meet with, with Senator Luger, and he couldn't get there for three days. Yeah. And uh, it was it was a travesty in that sense. But you know he wasn't going to miss votes, and that was that was the difference. Yeah. Mark Miles. Great relationship with Mark uh, still to this day. I mean, but he another one. He just, you know, I was he was he was in a rival fraternity. And um, um, but he reached out to me with Mac McNaught and they gave me, you know, what I would say is, you know, volunteer work. And um, so uh, and then he gave me the what I thought was the greatest honor ever until Bob Ward told me that it wasn't. And that was in the (laughs) Pan Am games. Miles called me into his office one day and he said, I got a job for you. I said, what's that? I said, you're going to be in charge of all the credentials for all the VIPs, elected officials, legislature, everything else. I said, man, that's really good. So I was having that. I was having dinner that evening with Bob Orr. I said, man, I said, I just got this unbelievable thing from Mark Miles. And he, Bob Orr leans over the table. He goes, are you kidding me? Do you realize how many people you're going to irritate? How many people you're going to say no to? He said, he, you don't have enough credentials to take care of everybody. He goes, that's a terrible job. <laughs> And Miles always said, I would laugh, and I said, but it was a great job, but man, I did have to say no to some people. Right? I had to do the ranking, right? Okay, well, you know, uh, House Ways and Means, yep, you got your tickets. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Newly elected person from wherever, Covington, Indiana. No, I don't know who you are. You know, I'm having breakfast with Mr. Miles tomorrow. I'm going to ask him about this yeah, when I see you know, him. It was a great opportunity, though. And I had a, and I got to meet some un- unbelievable people uh, during that, during that, that deal. I'll give you two more Ed Tracy. Ed and I were, you know, had a lot of fun because, you know, he was always lobbying the the governor for the chiropractic association. And Ken Cochran's brother was a chiropractor and I was very close to his brother and I never got caught up in all these issues. And so Ed kind of sought me out a lot of times because nobody would give him an answer. (laughs) So he would call me. I didn't, you know, I was a young guy. He he entertained me and took me out or whatever. I, I became very close to him. And then when he got involved, obviously, the partisan politics, he was always very friendly, and we, we, we had some great laughs. And uh, I showed up at uh, John Taylor. Remember John Taylor? The Absolutely. Palm I got to be close with him because he called me one day, and he said, everybody that I know says you're an asshole. I said, so, but one guy says you're not, so I want to meet you. So I had lunch with him, and so I got invited to his 60th birthday party, which was the Democrat National or State Committee, uh, City Did- Committee. Tracy You're, walked up to me and goes, this is like the worst in the world. What are you doing here? <laughs> well, Dave, for those who don't know, John Taylor was a, a Democrat attorney who uh, worked for the House of Representatives for years. Did you ever see the, the doodling that yeah. he would do but during yeah, but meetings? Not doodling. Everything he ever did was a handwritten note. He never sent an email. But he would, he would do he, – yeah. he he, yeah. it was artwork. Yeah. It, he would do these geometric drawings yeah. that, that when he was sitting in meetings. It was amazing stuff. Yeah. 
I got I got lots of more names, but in the interest of time, I'm going to throw out uh, Mr. Jim Voiles. You know, Jim um, is just a, a legendary guy. We we worked a lot, uh, or not worked a lot. We we got together pretty much during the Mitch Daniels campaign because he was, you know, he might not admit this, but he was one of those Democrat folks that was very enthralled with, you know, a guy like Mitch Daniels. He and a bunch of those guys. Uh, mm-hmm. I got to know him pretty well then, and now in the bar association, I've been involved and. In, uh, his uh, his grandson caddies uh, for has caddied for me out at Meridian Hills, which is uh, it's always he's always like yeah I have to go to my you know holiday gatherings and here somebody says this is a really wonderful person Bob Grant so that that kind of gets him crazy. Speaking of law school letters, uh, my son starts law school in the fall. Oh great, Dad McKinney, and his letter was from Jim Voiles. That's great. And I looked at Andrew and said, "Son, if this doesn't get you in, you don't have a chance in hell." <laughs> That's true. Jim, you have a question or two before we end? Well, sure. I mean, we've talked about how you've you've been a, a volunteer and a staffer and a fundraiser and a lobbyist. Uh, why haven't you ever run for office? Uh, I think for two reasons. One, I really was focused on being a lawyer. That's what I always wanted to be. And um, I had opportunities, you know, at Barnes & Thornburg, tremendous opportunities. One, to take over as the Indianapolis uh, office managing partner, which is a tremendous honor. I did that in my late 30s. Uh, and then I had the opportunity to run the firm. Uh, and so in that time period, I would have been probably a good candidate for something uh, in my own mind, maybe. But uh and then secondly, I just, you know, I saw what it did to people and their families. And I just, you know, I, I really didn't, you know, my family has been supportive. Uh, I don't think they would be supportive of me running for office, but I think they've been supportive of everything else I've done. And I just didn't think it was uh, that important. And, 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 and lastly, you know, the CIB chairmanship kind of gave me all I really wanted in that. I mean, that was just really, <laughs> oh a, that was really a tough situation for me. Um, it was very difficult uh, to do. And, and it was, and it was constantly being, you know, uh, subject to everything that you could ever imagine, every every allegation, whatever, all of which was not true. But mm-hmm. it was a tough, tough role. So kind of after that, I thought to myself, yeah. But you've thought about it. I thought about it, yeah. yeah. You, you, you looked at running for mayor this time? I did. I did. I did. Um, but, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that, again, Barnes and Thornburg had, you know, in the in the deal that they did for me in this transition it was very important they did me a great thing they they said we really want you to stay this this year and so this is kind of my final year although now they extended <laughs> to another year. but but it was important to me for the firm it was important for what they've done for me so yeah i i, I toyed with the idea but you know. you're involved in so many charities and nonprofits. little red door i know is mm-hmm. a big one for you urban league Indianapolis Foundation, how much of your, you've obviously been very successful and deservedly so, but how much of your devotion and dedication to helping charities relates back to your own youth background and how you grew up? Totally. I mean, I I had, you know, uh, my dad was seriously injured in a car accident, hit by two drunk drivers uh, when I was 10. Um, I was raised by a village, a village of teachers, uh, coaches. Um, there were unknown charitable things that I know were done for me uh, over the course of time. You know, I never, I never had to worry about going to college because two people in my community told me if you run out of money, we'll write you the check. And uh, so uh, I never had to draw on the check, but... Uh, so, and, and my parents, you know, and my mother in particular with all the things that happened, I, they were very, uh, they're very charitable in, in a long, you know, and my grandmother, my mother's side was, I mean, she was the unbelievably charitable. She used to bake pies for every, every organization in, in Gary, <laughs> Indiana. So, uh, so I think I, I heard a lot about it and I thought, uh, but I, it's, it, you got to give back. I mean, that's the key. And you had a, you had a, a friend whose family was very helpful, as I recall. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So as a matter of fact, yeah, he just passed away. His mother passed away last year and he passed away. So it's been a tough year for that. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. He kind of raised me. Lovers and I actually did the Luger bus trip in 82 in their basement. We stayed overnight. <laughs> the people said, well, you can just stay in our basement. We said, okay. So, you know, Lovers up all night doing all these maps, you know, where's this Avenue in Hammond and whatever. So, uh, 
yeah, a lot of people were good to me. So at the end of the day, you got to pay something back. But I always thought the greatest, the greatest. Everybody always Bob Orr used to say about press written about you. The best press that was ever written about me was when Russ Pulliam wrote an article years ago, which said I was the most unlikely guy that he would have ever figured out to have been as charitable. You know, he listed all my you know things. <laughs> we just don't think this guy is a you know would, would fit this criteria. And it was in good good spirit. But he he'd gotten involved when I got involved with outreach. The homeless shelter. But it was kind of a funny because everybody got a kick out of it. I was going, yeah, I guess that's not the guy. We don't think of Bob Grant and think of raising money for charity. Think about money, you know, shaking us down for political contributions. It, it, it's like me walking in over St. Mary's Child Center, getting called. I'm deputy chief of staff to Mayor Ballard. I get called into Ed Tracy's office, Democrat chairman of the Marion County uh, Party. And I walk in and I open the door. And Rex Early is sitting there. And I wrote about it in the Star, and you sent me a very nice note, Bob, and what I wrote about Rex's passing. And it was like, these guys, they all, they all get tarred, really. But in the end, all of us have so much more in common in what we support or what we like or what we devoted to than, than the fights you see on TV or in the press. And that's, I'm not blaming the media. I'm just saying, if all you ever heard, if all you knew about Ed Tracy and Rex Early was what you read or saw them say... <laughs> You wouldn't realize they became great friends. And I think it's also a tribute. And Jim, your 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 era, Jim, uh, Jan Carroll, um, you know, um, Gordon um, from Louisville, uh, Englehart, Englehart. I mean, you know, La Follette. I mean, you know, uh, it was a whole different world. I mean, the media was was after you in one sense, but it wasn't a got you every, you know, you, you, you gave them availability, but it was never personal. I mean, it was just never felt personal. Bob Orr used to tell me all the time and Jim, I mean, he had a great deal of respect for you, but he would, he would, there were very few people that really were after him in his mind. Right. Mm-hmm. And he was not, he was always available, always available. He did those weekly press conferences. He never, you know, we'd go to every little community. He would stop because they'd ask some radio state, he would stop. He'd do 15 minutes. He'd say, we're going to be 15 minutes, we'll do it. But it was a different sense then, and people were was, genuine. You know, Bob Rutherford, who was a radio reporter, uh, it knew that, that Bob Orr showed up for work at 7 every morning at the State House, and, and Rutherford would be waiting inside the, <laughs> the north door and would right. walk to the office with him and do an interview. And huh. I can't imagine a governor today just making himself available to a reporter in a hallway. Yeah. Well, then Bob Orr, you know, the other thing, Jim, I recall, because I was with him every time he did it, is that when he was lieutenant governor and there were issues, he would walk down to where the press shacks were and he would knock on somebody's door and say, hey, you know, I remember one time he was after somebody at the star and he, you know, he said, I saw you read this, you know, what, you know, I mean, not, you know, here's the facts. You know, people are like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, but it wasn't it wasn't aggressive. It wasn't like I'm going to go down there and I'm going to tell them because he, you know, he used to joke all the time. He said it's not going to make any difference because they're not going to change the story. But he said, I just want people to know what the facts were. I mean, and he was very much into that. But it was just a different time element. And we think about the relationships that we all have because nobody really felt I mean, we can disagree. You and I disagree on, on certain things. We can disagree, but you just you can't hate people. Right. It's just like and now you see a lot of this is. Uh, and it really bothers me. You know, some of it is just so, you know, it's like they just don't want to talk to you. you know? Overwrought, for sure. We've reached the point in the Leaders and Legends podcast where we ask the same five questions of all of our guests. Bob Grand, are you ready? Yep. What was your first job? My first job was delivering uh, precinct materials uh, in 1964. What was your first concert? Um, sticks. At the Sherwood Club in uh, Cherville. What year? God, Ish. <laughs> 70. You'd have to go by. I was going to look this up the other day because somebody else asked me this. I had to be like 73, 72, 73. If you could suggest any book for someone to read, which book would you recommend? Um, God, there's so many good books. Um I tell you the because the, there's so many I can't I can't uh, think straight here. I'm just thinking of going through my mind all the books. Uh, the the most recent book I read was the Churchill book, uh, which was really fascinating given where we're at today. The uh, Boris Johnson yeah. one? No, the, the, uh, Martin Gilbert. Yeah. So mm-hmm. uh, so it was it, it was 
it was fascinating about you know all, all the things that he was proven right to be is just amazing. I mean, just amazing, and his and his ability to come back and his ability to convince them it was just amazing, you know. And I didn't know, and he was kind of a landed gentry kid, right? He mm-hmm. it was you know kind of a, but boy, you talk about an interesting. When you're born in Blenheim Palace, you're not yeah. struggling. Yeah, exactly. Number four, if you could witness any event in history, be there in person as it happens, which event would you choose? I think I answered this question before, so I have to give a different answer. Um, I would have uh, liked to have seen Abraham Lincoln speak. Any particular? Gettysburg Address. It'd only take 18 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Three and a half minutes. <laughs> Number five, if you could have dinner with anyone living today, two hours off the record, whom would you choose? Feel free to choose Shella. Okay, Jim Shella. Um, <laughs> would Pat t- t- Rios t- choose Jim Shella? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, this is this is kind of a this is kind of an interesting one because I was thinking about it the other day. Uh, I would say Condoleezza Rice. I mean, I've met her a couple times, but I think she would be fascinating to have dinner with. And if you spoke Russian, you could have dinner in Russian. Yeah. Unbelievably, unbelievable brain and yeah. talent. Yeah. Jim, you got one more thing you want to ask him before we let him go? I think we've covered pretty much everything. I think we have. I think we have. Thanks for the opportunity. Well, thanks for playing along. You have been listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, an Indiana-based public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Garmon Construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and NFP, a national insurance broker with strong local content. Our guest today has been attorney, civic leader, and charitable giver par excellence, Bob Grand. Bob, thank you. Thank you. Bob is known for one thing besides dressing really well. It's his loyalty. And a lot of us have prospered and been subject to that. And we're very grateful. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. This podcast was produced and edited by Chris Spangle and Leaders and Legends, LLC. If you're interested in starting a podcast or taking yours to the next level, please contact us at leadersandlegends.net.